Uh, sorry, I don't know how to words right now. I'm kind of <laughs> sick. What is an English? What is English? Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Debatable with your hosts, Nina and Kyle. I'm Kyle, I won a spelling quiz B in 5th grade. This is Nina, she just got back from Baguio City last weekend when she won the Northern Luzon InterVarsity. Stop! Stop, but thank you. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Yay! Today we're going to be talking about arguments and rebuttals, which we both feel like are the bread and butter of all debaters. Yeah, but despite that, I think arguments and rebuttals are severely misunderstood or not understood enough in the circuit. And this, despite debaters always making them, they probably don't know that there's a proper method to it or that there's a sort of an art form that comes into it, right? Like I personally love arguments and I have a lot of feelings about it because I think that this is the main end product of all debaters. Like beyond rounds, you are able to use the ideas you create during prep time. Like, I use a lot of the arguments we've made into paper ideas or oh, yeah, yeah. like intellectual discussions with other people. And I think it's just great how you can take things from scratch and then just compile them into creating a sort of picture or painting. So you like making arguments because you feel like you are the god of your creation. Yes, exactly. Wow. Because I always thought of it more as like a DJ gig where <laughs> what <laughs> you get a bunch of information from different fields mm. and you put them into different contexts. You essentially remix knowledge that you already have oh. and you make them into new ideas. Fair enough. So you are a god and I'm just a DJ. Well, god could be seen as a DJ. <laughs> okay, Lord fine. of the Rings, you know? What? Everything's made out of song. Oh, yes. Right. Aww, the I'm universe fl- is made of I'm song. so glad you know that. Yes, I learned from the best. I okay, kind of want a tangent to wait, Lord no, of the no, Rings No, no, stop, now. stop. Okay, <laughs> back to why we like talking about arguments and rebuttals. So, again, we have many feelings about it. So what we'd want to do for this podcast in particular is just to sort of help everyone break it down. Again, though, it's just our way of doing it. We ourselves are not experts, I'd say. Like, we're okay. Like, we've, we've gone through enough. We've coached enough. But yeah. are we the authority? Probably not. I think the only authority for how to make an argument is you. No, I, I'm serious. Because everyone ought to have a different way of making an argument. Because an argument is essentially your way of processing information. Mm-hmm. So I think this discussion is just like a starting point. You're going to have to find your own voice. And if that means... Finding your own structure, that's fine. Although, I think there are probably some essentials that you need to have. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get to that later. Yeah. The first thing, though, that we want to do is give you a general overview of what an argument is and what role it plays. So what's an argument, Kyle? Well, technically, a whole debate can be considered an argument. But for our purposes, I don't think we have to use that very broad definition. Mm-hmm. We can be as specific as an argument is a point or several points leading to a conclusion that is in support of one side or another. Mm -hmm. That's fair. I I think as well that when you look at arguments, at least in our context, we have to also analyze what role it plays. If you notice in debates, you don't just throw a bunch of arguments to determine who wins. There's a lot more sophistication that comes into it. If anything, arguments are the last things that you end up prepping for, I'm pretty sure. Because you're still setting up a context, you're setting up a frame, you're creating a strategy. So arguments are just meant to supplement those things. Yeah. So just because you have a bunch of arguments doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win a debate. I myself have (laughs) run a speech where I ran 13 arguments. How? And then I I lost. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. Yeah. (laughs) Because they were arguments without purpose. And I remember last time, I was talking about how an argument, even though that's what most debaters fixate on, especially the newer ones, the most important part of a speech is actually the frame and the burdens, the goal of the debate. Because if you do not have the goal of the debate, if you do not have the context, if you don't have the burden, and you're not going to tie it back to those things then the argument is just an argument. It doesn't have a purpose in the greater context of the debate. 
there's no strategic value to it. Yeah. But if we're just looking at arguments in themselves, though, I think that there's still a lot of complexities that come into it. You still need to learn how to build arguments in themselves. So even if we're saying they are like not the top priority when you're creating a case, at least for us, it's still very valuable to know how to do it. So the next thing we want to do now is to give you a general structure that you can use when creating your own arguments. There are many different acronyms that you can use for it. But again, this is just a suggestion. It's a good starting point. So if you want to make variations on these acronyms, please do. Because we always love seeing you creative acronyms Acronism. for an argument structure. Because Nina always grew up with HEAL as an acronym, which is Handle, Explanation, Example, and link. then Link. Yeah. I grew up with LAST, which is Label, Analysis, Substantiation, and Tieback. But recently, we found out there's a new acronym called ARL. ARL. Assertion, Reasoning, Example, and Link. But if you notice, despite all the different acronyms, there are still like mainly four parts that everyone uses. Right? Yeah. So the first one is what we call a label or a title or a handle. handle. Um, it's basically what the argument is all about. That you can sum it up into one sentence or one statement. So there are, I think, three ways that you can create a label. First is, it's a phrase. Okay, it's a phrase. So usually you're going to look at particular concepts. So in my first argument, I'm going to talk about this concept. But... I don't want to recommend this because sometimes those concepts may be value neutral, which means that both sides can claim that value for themselves. Yeah. So for example, if the motion is about something about social legal or something, yeah. and then <laughs> use your imagination, and then <laughs> Prime Minister says, my first argument is about the right to life, and then opposition says, oh, our first argument is also about the right to life. Essentially, that means both sides can claim that argument. So that's the reason why we're not comfortable recommending this first way. What we do recommend is to use like a sentence. The tip that Nina and I learned from our time at the UP Debate Society is that you want to make sure that your argument can finish this particular sentence. Motion because, because black. Argument. Yeah. Yeah, so... If the motion was this house would create super soldiers, the possible label for the argument is you would create super soldiers because it minimizes casualties in war. So that's your title. The third way that you can do it is to use it in the form of a sentence. That is to say, you make it more of a discussion than it is just you declaring certain things. So using the super soldier argument again, instead of saying that it helps minimize casualties, a possible way that you can formulate the label is which side minimizes casualties. Mm. And benefit to this particular label is it makes comparisons between both sides more apparent because it's already part of the question that you want to answer. This is also a trick a lot of whips use. So you might be a bit iffy with using questions. Like I personally am because I feel like I'm taking the job of a whip. But there's no harm there. I mean, most first speakers also work as whips anyway. And most first speaker speeches should be able to predict the whole debate. So if you're able to give issues already from the start, then that's great. That's why you're first speaker and whip. Yeah. But, but of course, team. not everyone is like that, right? Yeah. So it depends. Second part is the explanation or the analysis. No matter, again, what acronym you're using, it all boils down to breaking down the handle and title that you gave initially. So I personally think this step is rather complex. Like, how do you create a good substantiation or good explanation? I think that it just always boils down to proving that it's logically sound. So you always ask yourself questions. You're never satisfied with the answer. And the way you master this personally is just by reading a lot, watching debates a lot and training like trying to find what works for you like because of all the training i've gotten i'm comfortable giving three structural reasons or i always make it so, so that i break my ideas down into three parts just so it's a lot more palatable and bite-sized though yeah. you can make it your own method like some people just have one 
giant idea that they expound really well or like five points of premises before they get to the next part. When I was younger, a regular tip that was given to me by older debaters at the time was that you always have to ask yourself three questions. How, why, and so what. Mm. Let's go back to the super soldiers example about minimizing casualties. You first ask how this happens. And then you're going to make an assertion again about what will happen once you have these super soldiers. And then you're going to explain why that assertion is likely to be true. Why is it likely that this assertion is going to happen? And then after you keep pushing that line of reasoning, you keep asking the questions over and over again. The last question you want to ask is, so what? So what if this argument is true? This is where you talk about like the strategic implications of the argument. Why is it even important that we're minimizing casualties to begin with? No, right? I didn't know that. Hmm? I, di- I didn't know those three parts. I'm learning. Wow. Yeah, wow. See, yeah. this is educational for me as well. So after explanation and analysis, you get to the next part, which is the example. Or what did, how did, what's your acronym? Substantiation. Like, is it also examples though? Yes. Okay, so we use examples. And the reason for this is even if you explain something theoretically really well, you still have to ground it and make it seem very realistic. So you cite real world examples or just sort of try to give situations. So there are three main ways to make examples, at least the three that I have come across and have boiled it down to. The first type of example you can give in a round is a hypothetical. And these are usually in philosophical motions where obviously it's a thought experiment so you don't know. So these are the kinds of examples like, oh, imagine you were a person walking down the street. Ch -ch -ch. (laughs) What if the motion about karmic balance? Yeah. Yeah, the motion about karmic balance and how the issue was about how fair it was. And the argument was saying that it's not fair if you're using karmic balance because it's about good deeds. So what if there was a baby and the only thing it did after it was born was accidentally slap its mother and then it died. <laughs> so according to the karmic balance theory, it would go to hell or something. This was an AIV, right? Yeah, it was, was an it, AIV. Was it used in the round or was it just an example you whispered to me while the round no, was No, I, I think it was used in the round. Yeah. Yeah, so th- those are examples of hypotheticals. Like, we don't know if they're real. Chances are they're not real, but it's just a debater asking you to imagine a situation. I don't recommend this, honestly. I think it's the weakest form of e- example. Because if you give a hypothetical, it's easy for me to rebut with a hypothetical. Like, okay, sure, the baby accidentally sa- slapped its mother. But what if the first thing it did instead was give it a kiss? So what now? Woo! Mm. <laughs> right? So you can't really win with a hypothetical. It's just always going to circle back. And you're never going to end. It's just going to be a battle of who can get a better fictional story out there and make it believable. So that's the first type of example. The second type of example is to use generics. Or basically, these are facts, like statistics. Yes, they're real-world examples as well, but they're mostly harder to grasp. It's like saying, oh, Hollywood is pedophilic. It has a lot of abuses, etc. So obviously, these are things that are accepted as fact, but they're not uh, as strong as they could be because, again, these are still things that could be contested. But at least they're not as weak as hypotheticals because there's like a real-world basis to it. It's not purely left to one's imagination. So I think the the second type, the generic one, it's it's okay, but it's not that impactful yeah. in the end. Not like the third type, which is to talk about like a specific example, which is... Okay, I, I recognize that it's a vague term since we've been talking about examples this entire time. But when I say specific examples, what I mean is particular case studies. It is a small story that is significant to the round. So for example, if my fact or my generic example is that Hollywood has a lot of abusive people, my specific example could be just citing people like Harvey Weinstein or... I don't know, who are other abusive Hollywood people? There's a lot. Basically, the point is, if you're able to ground it to people and proper nouns and places, then it makes your argument a lot more believable. Of course, though, you have to be very careful when using examples. I know it can be tempting to just cite a lot of statistics or to cite a lot of people and proper nouns, but they should never, ever replace analysis. I've seen so many rounds where people give the title and then they just give an example and then they conclude. Huh? That's it? They, they use examples as an excuse or as the argument itself yeah 
We know a lot of debaters who argue by example, which could be valid if the main inspiration for the argument it was the example. That's fine, as long as you also have analysis by asking, what do these examples demonstrate? Yeah. yeah. So that's basically it for examples. It's not again like a really big chunk of the argument, but to have two or three in each argument becomes very useful and important. It makes your case sound a lot more believable. It makes it look like you know what you're doing. Or you know what you're talking about, at least. Next part is the tie back, which is what you call it, or link, as what I call it. it. Yeah. Basically, it's just telling us why the argument is important in relation to the motion. Yeah. So what I said earlier, and in another episode about how an argument should always be linked back to what the argument is supposed to prove, the burdens, and the burdens will have to be linked back to the goal of the debate, right? So. A way that you can look at tiebacks is to show how the argument proves the burden and how it also ends up proving the goal of the debate. Mm. This is also what I meant by so what, because the so what part of it is the conclusion where you're going to say why is it even important that we're talking about this, and it's important because it fulfills a particular burden. Yeah. So the common mistake is that people just repeat the motion. Like no. oh, this is important because this this debate is about why we should create super soldiers. Like don't make that mistake. Like I made that mistake when I started out. I just thought it was, you know, just just like a requirement that I had to say the motion at the start of my speech and the end of my speech. So it's wrong. Don't do that. You have to be a lot more sophisticated when tying back. So remember what your goal is, what your burden is. Just like Kyle said. So that's basically the argument structure. So we taught you about labels, we taught you about examples and explanations and tiebacks. So what we want to do before we finally move on to rebuttals is to do a bit of tips for arguments. Like how do you make it foolproof? How do you make it stronger? So I think there are three very important notes to take when you create arguments or as you're creating your argument. The first would be don't be very generic. Like remember most motions discuss a particular issue and even if you're using similar ideas you shouldn't forget to nuance it as we call it in debate world or make it specific to what you are talking about so if you remember a few episodes back we discussed social movements and we gave you a lot of very generic arguments you can use for all social movement debates so you're not gonna win if you just parrot what you heard from the podcast. It'll be stronger if you manage to really link it to the particular struggle of a particular movement. So if it's about backlash, you can't don't just say that backlash will happen. Talk about why the backlash is really severely bad for this particular group. Yes. Yeah. But if you do parrot it because of our podcast, that is very flattering. Thank you. <laughs> but if you parrot it. But also include new ones that will be even more flattering to yes. us. So please do it. Please do it. The second tip that we have for argument making is to avoid insignificance. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> but you That's know. That's deep, bro. <laughs> yes, but basically it means that avoid making arguments for making the argument's sake. You know. For the sake of making an argument. Uh, sorry, I don't know how to words right now. I'm kind of <laughs> sick. What is an English? What is English? Basically, just make sure that it, it, it's still relevant to the topic. For example, the motion is, this house would create super soldiers. I'm sorry we keep using this motion. It's just the first thing that pops into our minds right now. So, this house would create super soldiers. And your first argument is... because we, the environment. No, not bad. That's oh. really bad. <laughs> That's like a super bad argument. Let's think of a, an argument that you could possibly hear from a really new debater. Probably one of them would say, because war is bad. Right. We want to create super soldiers because war is bad. Oh yeah, right? I see. see so it? in that case, it's not significant because... Both sides wouldn't both want sides, war. Like, nobody was like, yeah, let's go to war. <laughs> yeah. I really want to kill some people Yeah, so, so the argument is insignificant because it's not really an argument for your side alone. It's not mutually exclusive as we call it in debate world. So basically, just make sure that when you're creating an argument, you ask yourself... Are you sure I'm the only one who can use this in the round? If you think the other side can use it as well, then probably think twice before yeah. creating and spending your time going through the four steps when you make an argument. Yeah, this is this is what I said about some arguments being value neutral. Mm -hmm. If both sides can claim the same benefit, then it's value neutral. Yeah. And you can also hear that in a lot of 
rebuttals, which we'll get into in a bit. Yeah. So the last thing and the last note, I think, is to avoid dependency, meaning that sometimes your arguments are contingent on another argument. And like I, I encountered this last weekend in NLIV. I can say this because it's it's. I was against UPDS, so basically what they argued was that you you have to oh, I have to explain the entire motion for them to get it. Okay, take your time. No, uh, it's just it's a long story. But basically, their first argument was about why particular candidates are likely to win, and then their second argument was because they're likely to win, they can pass particular policies. So if you notice, their second argument is reliant on the candidates actually winning, which is the first argument. So the reason why it's bad to have dependency arguments is because, for example, I could just debunk the first argument, and if I prove that the candidates aren't gonna win, then the second argument also fails. Because how will they make policies if I prove they wouldn't win? Actually, I think that both those arguments that you just cited are actually just part of the same argument. Yeah, I think so too. But in that case, the second argument is just the conclusion. The conclusion to the first argument. Yeah. So that's another way you can accidentally make dependency arguments. Like perhaps because they really weren't meant to be separated in the first place. So just keep that in mind. Can your argument stand alone? Can they survive if the other argument is defeated? That's how you know you have a strong independent argument. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think that one way that you can practice this is to look at what are the underlying assumptions of the argument to begin with. So in the case that you just mentioned, Nina, the underlying assumption was that they're not going to win. Yeah. Um, And you'd be surprised that a lot of arguments are actually built upon some assumptions that are actually rebuttable. But since they don't explicitly say those assumptions, it's not that easy to rebut. Uh Which leads us to the next part. Wow, nice segue. You're on a roll, man. The next part that we want to discuss now is about rebuttal. So I think it's equally as important and it's also something you should learn because you may have the strongest arguments, but if it's not able to stand up against a good rebuttal, then you're dead, bro. Yeah. You're I dead. also think that rebuttals are equally important because debate is essentially a discursive activity where there has to be a clash of ideas. Mm. So debate is not just two very well-constructed ships passing by each other at night. Wow, yeah, they that's have deep. To, they have to crash into one another. That's a sad way to look at it, though. I don't know. Fine, they're gonna meet each other in the middle. Yeah, and then they're yeah. gonna have a fist fight. <laughs> fine, okay, fine. Because the boats, man, it's expensive. They're yeah, gonna but crash. I think it's a really good, like, metaphor because no, Kyle, both it's teams not. will try to dismantle the other team's ship. Yeah, but in a debate, if you lose, you don't die. <laughs> if it's a boat, you drown if you lose. Okay, so I will just say in this metaphorical sea... See, this is why hypotheticals are really bad forms of examples. Ooh, Ooh. Nice tie back yeah. there, Nina. I want to roll too, man. I want to roll too. Anyway, That's why going you're back, the champion. Sh- shut up. Anyway, going back. So... Why did we include rebuttals in this really, really long podcast as of now? Like, it's probably going to be one of our longer episodes. Yes. And I think it's important to just discuss all of this in one go. Because... If you think this is long, wait for next week. Oh. <laughs> well, that's a... Ooh. I wonder what it is. Happy Holy Week, friends. Anyway. So, the reason why it's important to us is because rebuttals can also form a constructive. I've had so many instances where my rebuttals end up becoming extensions as well. Basically, my trick when I don't have an extension in a round is I'll just rebut and hope that something comes out that I can build along the way. You yes. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. You're right. But there are also some arguments that also function as direct responses. So earlier you were saying that there are rebuttals that might be considered arguments. There are also arguments that may be considered rebuttals. Yes. So remember this one time, we were talking about breaking up oligopolies in the tech industry, and we were in opening opposition, Nina. Yeah. And basically my extension was that these oligopolies might be good for competition within within the market, mm-hmm. which was an argument that we came up with during prep, but it also served as a direct response to the case of government yeah so if you're lucky or if you get a good feel of arguments and rebuttals like they just become one big mesh which is great 
Because it means that whatever you run or whatever you prep becomes multi-purpose. And that's what you want. To be the most efficient form of debater you. Right? Debater you. So I'm just tying back to a lot of things now. So that was like our UPTS campaign thing. Be the better you, be the better you. Yeah. I think it was really witty. I thought it was corny. Okay. Yeah, we're getting so sidetracked here. It's, it's weird. It's okay. It's okay. We're we're organic. So the, what we want to do now, since we gave you a general overview of rebuttals, we're going to give you the parts of our rebuttal as well, or our rebuttal structure. Similar to the arguments, again, this is just a suggestion. Do what you want. But I think that you should at least keep these things in mind so that you can create your own structure that works well for you in the future. So the beginner level structure, or what every debater first learns when they enter, is the not true even if structure. So it's very simple, I already discussed this in the last episode. Like a not true is basically giving reasons or statistics or examples that disprove the argument of your previous speaker, or whoever speaker it is that you're engaging with. Yes. And even if is to say why, assuming they were correct, why their argument is still not sufficient to win them the debate. So it's important because it shows that you're willing to engage. The next part of this discussion is the Nina and Kyle method. Because we we weren't content with the not true even if structure. <laughs> we wanted to go the extra mile when we started. So Nina and I usually have around three at the minimum levels of rebuttal, but we always prefer to have it at like five levels. Or four. Like beyond three, basically. Okay, beyond three. So what I we're like going five. to show you, what I'm going to show you is four levels. How did, how did you come up with a five one? What, what's the fifth one? Just, oh, all right. Just okay. butt it just, in later. All yeah. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So the first is the meta response. So instead of going not true initially, I'm going to first analyze if the argument is significant to the round. So for example, if the argument of the opponent is there's going to be backlash, I'm going to immediately respond with, that's not relevant because backlash can exist in all other debates as well. Or it's not a very specific argument. So I'm going to like discredit the value of the argument without even telling you it's not true yet. Like I'm yeah. assuming it's true. I'm just saying it's not important. For this first level, it I also use it as, like I said, it's a meta response. So this is also where I insert very technical responses like, this is a logical leap. In order for this argument to fly, it also needed to prove this analysis or this assertion which they never did Mm -hmm. so basically the first level is the more technical side so the quality of the argument whether or not it's a straw man or if it's a misrepresentation i sometimes make fun of it if it was built on like six minutes oh first of all this argument wasn't even very well built it was built at 6 30 yeah but to be fair there are some debaters who are so good they can build anything yes but (laughs) i think it, it still helps if you point out how little time they spent on the argument, you know? Alright, yeah. The second level of the rebuttal is to say why it's not true. This is what Nina was talking about earlier. Yeah, so basically you know what it is already. It's, it's the same. But right? what I would say is there are two ways to say that it's not true. First is that it is factually untrue, which is what Nina said already. Mm-hmm. The next one is that it's logically untrue. So this is where you look at the sequence of events that the opposing side was talking about and poke a hole in that sequence and say, this sequence does not make sense. Like, what does that look like? Um, this is where you say, like, really? Is this even gonna happen? Oh, okay. yeah. Fair, fair. So it's not just factually untrue. It can also be logically untrue. Yeah. So the next part is the even if. But the way I do even if for my method is different because I'm gonna assume that the argument is, is correct. My even if is to show why the argument is still incomplete. Meaning that, did it really tie back properly to the motion? Or assuming the argument is correct, did it actually create a dent in the discussion? Or sway the judges to any side? Like I would point out here that even if the argument is true, it's not a powerful argument to have in the round anyway. So that's my third response. Yeah. So I remember this one tournament you were in, The motion was about granting women female researchers research grants on the basis of their sex. And then government was saying, if you grant them the research grants, 
they're going to have credentials and the credentials will mean that they're noticed and it's going to empower them in the future. And my response was basically just saying, oh, even if it were true, they never answered the question of why does it have to be given on the basis of their sex, right? So even if it was true, if they didn't prove the burden, which is why should it be given on the basis of their sex, then the argument is still incomplete. Yep. And the last level, or the fourth level that we usually have in all of our rebuttals, is to assume the best form of the argument, but still say that it's weaker than our case. So this is our favorite, which is best case, worst case analysis. I'm going to build their argument for them, fill up all the holes, and still prove why either one, it's not responsive to our side, or two, it's still not the most important argument in the round. So this is like me throwing them a bone. Yeah. I think this is a, a really nice way to rebut because you can tell the judge that you are not just arguing against a weak team or you're not just rebutting what's there, but you're willing to go the extra mile because you're that confident that your case is correct. Yeah. Whenever I do second speaker or whip, I always have an extra level, which is to say that it was already preempted by my previous speaker. Oh, so That's your fifth level. Yeah. The first one, I say a technical response. And then second, I say, oh, this was actually already preempted by Nina. Mm. And they just didn't evolve to it or they didn't listen to the argument. Oh, okay. The third level is it's not even true or it's a new response that I'm going to come up with. So sometimes I conclude the arguments for them and then give a new response. And then the even ifs. Ah, okay. The two even ifs. That's oh. how I get to five. Ah, well, eh. I think that you just kind of broke down the my first one into two parts. Like basically my first part is the argument is insignificant because it doesn't fit into the debate or because my partner already responded to it. It's like the same basically. Well, it depends. It depends. Because the technical response might be different okay, fine. from it being unresponsive to what That's you true. already preempted. That's true. But basically, like this just goes to show you there are so many ways to build your rebuttal structure. Like in the five years I've known Kyle, up until now, we still haven't decided what the best form is because there's just there's just different styles for different people. I'm more comfortable with four responses. Kyle's comfortable with five. There are days I have eight, right? So it just kind of changes every time. Just keep it in mind. Always practice. Always experiment with the variations that we've presented to you. So that's the method that we have for rebuttals. Like with the arguments... I want to end this segment by giving final tips that you can do for using your rebuttals. But obviously, these tips can also apply to arguments given that in the end, they could serve the same purpose. So when you're prepping arguments and rebuttals, the first thing you have to take note of is your limitations. You only have 7 minutes. Do not try to run 13 arguments in your 7 minutes. Right, Kyle? No. Do it if you can. If (laughs) If you can. But... Basically, know your limits. I have a limit of three arguments, three levels each. Um, I'm not sure what your limit is, Kyle. What's your limit? It depends on the motion. Yeah, okay. So it depends on the motion. Just have a good feel of your own capabilities. It's so nice to get carried away during prep, but it's going to be useless if you're not able to run them in the seven minutes that were given to you. So be very careful with that. Second is be clear with signposting. Yes, I, think I that's agree. Very yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we are... Kyle and I are a sucker for labels, man. We we love numbering. All yeah, that's of our that's the reason why if you notice, you always have lists. Because the list method allows us to signpost things better. And the reason why signposting is important is because it tells the judge that this is something that you have to listen to. So if the judge doesn't hear a signpost You're not likely to write it down. Yeah. So this is where you say Hey, judge, this is the first argument. The yeah. first argument is like this. Yeah, I feel like, honestly, I've I've had a judge track in the past. Like, I judged my first two years in debating. And I'm always compelled to write numbers down if the debater tells me to write numbers down. It's just, I'm just caught in this weird spell where I have to do everything that the debater tells me to. I noticed. Yeah, so it's really powerful. And I think that you should take advantage of that. If you notice, I'm uh, obsessed with structure. Like, even this podcast has different segments and parts. Because I think it makes it a lot easier to listen to. Or at least that's my assumption. Let me know if 
This is not easy to listen to. I can adjust for you, man. Just let us know. So that's the second tip. And the last tip is obviously know what to prioritize. I think that people get caught in the trap of just building things or having as many arguments as possible. But I always say that put the things that could win you on top. Yeah. Like sometimes you just need one argument that can propel you to victory. Always prioritize that. And it's not just a stylistic choice. It's also a practical choice. Because in the worst case that you run out of time, obviously you should be willing to let go of the least important stuff. So I put my least important arguments at the last part so that if I forgot to say them, my case isn't really hurt. Maybe I'll just, you know, feel sad a bit because I didn't get to run it. But at least it doesn't potentially lose me the round. The question here though is, how do you decide which things to prioritize? And again, I think it's something that you learn through experience or just when you have a sense of what is the importance of the things that you're saying? What is the importance of this level of analysis? What is the importance of this level of rebuttal? So sometimes, there are some really great technical responses, but I end up not running them because they're essentially not that good of a use of my time. There was this one time, one of our alumni told me, told us actually that there are some debaters that get so fixated on the matter the examples so what he likes to do is to give a piece of matter that there's one part of that example that it's is wrong. inaccurate ah. and the opposing debater will fixate on that it's and like it a wastes a lot of time it's like a bait yeah it's a bait so always know what the purpose of a particular rebuttal is or if the time could be used for something that's more effective in delivering your point I used to do that to Kyle. I used to give him false matter in the round and he fixates on it. Especially if the motion is about philosophy or religion. I'll just say one tiny wrong thing and then I'll get Kyle to spend like two minutes on it. Ta-da! I win the round. <laughs> I can't help it, okay? <laughs> yeah, so like avoid that. I think even the most seasoned debaters have a tendency to just get carried away and fixate it. So that's it. So what have we taught you so far? We taught you about arguments. A general overview, its structure, some tips, and we also taught you general structure for rebuttals and tips that you can use. So, wow, we spent a lot of time on this episode, but I think it was very important to go through everything thoroughly. Of course, though, since this is our initiative to help you learn things better, if there were certain things that were not clear to you, or if you still have questions about arguments and rebuttals, feel free to contact us at, at Podcast DBTBL. That's at Podcast Debatable without the vowels for debatable. You can send us a DM there. Slide, slide into, into our, our DMs. Slide into, wink, our D- wink. <laughs> slide into our DMs if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes. We also want to thank everyone as well. We've reached several milestones since we started this podcast. So we've hit like 3,000 views. Yeah. Um, we got to the main page of news and politics section in Spotify. We are next to Freakonomics in the educational section, which is, which oh my is god. amazing. Oh my god. Because Freakonomics is my favorite podcast like, on when, Spotify. When Kyle and I started out, we would marathon Freakonomics together while drinking. So it's, it's a big deal to us that we are now next to our idols. Freakonomics is what inspired me to get started. And ah, here we are. Sorry. Oh, Freakonomics. I'm so, so I'm so killing. Anyway, so thank you. All of this wouldn't be possible without your help. We are just powerful because you actually care about this nerdy project of ours. You really you. are. You really are our community, community of nerds. nerds. And we love you all so much. So please follow our Twitter. Keep listening. Wait for important announcements. I heard we might be selling some stickers soon. Ooh. So, really nice laptop stickers. Yeah. So, I also heard that what, we're you? gonna have a special episode soon. Ah, I heard it might be like an hour long or more. Or more. Talking about Kyle's favorite thing in the world. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. Now, I think if you know Kyle, you can kind of guess. Also, it's Holy Week next week, so we'll see you then. Again, thank you for listening to this episode of Debatable. I'm Nina. I'm Kyle. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ding, ding. Ding, ding.